just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus cause your name is power
presence I speak Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the whole that are watching online, if you're in the area, we'd love to have you come and join us. And I know I praise the Lord for the ability to watch it when you're not here, but it's not the same as when you're in the room and the presence of the Holy Ghost is moving. And if you can get here, we'd love to have you join us here. I've been preaching the last few weeks on this subject, draw near, draw near. And God's been really speaking this word over our church. And we've not only been talking about it, but experiencing it in our times of prayer and fasting. We've heard his voice, and God has been responding in a unique way, in a special way. And here's the scripture that we've kind of based this sermon series on in James chapter 4, verse 8. James said, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. 
Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. It's a promise from the Lord. As we've been drawing near to Him, oh my goodness, has He been drawing near to us. So many testimonies. People have told me, they said, Pastor, I've fasted many times, but I've never had the the nearness of the Lord like I'm experiencing in this month of fasting. People have been telling me, Lord's given them a fresh revelation as they're fasting and as they're seeking the face of the Lord. And and people are, are talking about how God's just, His presence is manifest. I tell you, on Friday nights, if you've missed Friday nights, oh my goodness, how incredible. I'm going to just make you feel really bad this morning. From No, not really. I do want to make you feel jealous that you'll come whenever we do this. I don't know when we'll do it again, but we've done the last three Friday nights, and there's been such a presence of God in this place, such a powerful move of God. I've just sat and wept and wept and wept in the presence of the Lord as God's just poured out as we've worshiped him. Let me tell you, I believe this is a special season. And coming out of this season, God has been working to prepare us for what's next. And on Friday night as we kind of close, Shantae mentioned, she said, whatever you've been doing and drawing near to the Lord, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't look at it as just, okay, I did that. That was for the month of January. You need to press in because God has even more. God's guiding us with his eye, as I shared last week. This is a season of harvest, and he's calling us to move in. I believe we're going to see this year harvest coming to the church. I'm believing for prodigals coming home. I'm believing for those that used to walk with the Lord and have backslidden to repent and come back to him. Those that are walking in darkness are going to see a great light, that there's going to be revival in Kania, Ohio. Amen. So today I want to share on this subject, knowing, knowing. As we draw near to God and as we seek his face, God is calling us to a knowing, to an intimacy that you can't get when you have relationship with God at arm's length. You know, God's not looking for a people who will dedicate an hour to him on Sunday morning. You know that because if you come here, it ain't going to be over in an hour. It's not a Sunday morning kind of relationship that God says, okay, come get your little blessing. Now just go have your week and do whatever you want. Come back again next Sunday. God's calling us to know him. God's calling us to relationship. And, you know, there's a great gulf between having information and having experience. In the church in 2022, we have no lack of the availability of information. Sometimes we have too much information. We, we, we need information. We need the Word of God. We need to know His Word. But we need to then attach that to experience directly with God. Now, I like Texas Roadhouse. I haven't been to Texas Roadhouse this month. Because I'm existing like a squirrel, you know, foraging for nuts and fruits and vegetables that I can eat right now. But pretty soon, I'll get back to Texas Roadhouse. If you haven't been, Texas Roadhouse, contrary to the name, didn't start in Texas, actually started in Clarksville, Indiana. Texas Roadhouse, every side that they make at every Texas Roadhouse, they make from scratch. 
You go to Texas Roadhouse and you get a side. It doesn't come in some big, you know, thing that they just dole it out. They make those from scratch. They serve 300,000 meals a day at Texas Roadhouse. That's a lot. 44% of the items that are on the Texas Roadhouse menu are steak related. Those of you that are fasting and you're but you're a carnivore at heart. You know what I'm talking about. Now that's a whole lot of information. It's one thing to know the facts about Texas Roadhouse. But when you walk in and they're making the rolls right over here on the side and you sit down and they bring you those rolls that are so, it, it's like, you know, they give you that butter. It's like eating a baby angel. It's <laughs> like the, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> and then, if you're like me, you order ribeye steak. Medium, true medium. Don't overcook that. I'd rather have a little medium rare than I would have it overcooked. And they bring that thing out. And you, you know, you, you've got, I, they bring it out. I've got my fork and my knife already in my hand. And rest assured, when the fast is over, we're going to be there. I'm going to be ready, okay? Now, when I begin to carve that up, you know what I'm not thinking? I am not thinking, you know, it's wonderful that this place started in Clarksville, Indiana. I am not sitting there thinking, wow, it's incredible that they serve 300,000 meals a day and that 44% of their menu items are still. I'm just thinking, I want the experience. Because it's different to know about something than it is to know something. And it's different to know about him than to know him. It's different when I've got a relationship with Jesus that has impacted me on a personal level. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just that we get into a theological debate back and forth. I'm telling you, I know him. I've experienced him. He walks with me every day. I've, I've got a knowing inside of me. And God is giving us an open invitation this month, this season, to this church. And he's saying, would you know me? Would you experience me? Would you cut off everything else that you have to turn off and just get alone with me and come deeper with me so that you can know me in a deeper way than ever before? That's what God's calling us to. So today, I'm going to read to you one of my favorite psalms. I don't ever say it's my favorite psalm because I just love the whole book. But one of my favorites. And as we read through, I want us to read in light of what we've been through. I want us to, to read in light of the challenges that we've walked through and we've been facing over the last couple of years. I want us to, to read in light of what God's speaking to us right now. So take your Bibles and flip over to Psalm 91 or turn your Bible on and go to Psalm 91. There's one verse I'm going to preach on, but I'm going to read the whole thing, if that's okay. And I'll try to not preach it all today. Psalm 91, verse 1, He who dwells, it's a place of living, abiding, knowing. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's a biblical principle right there. Verse 2 says, And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge 
and my fortress. Can you say that? Can you make it personal? My God, in him will I trust. It's a statement of personal faith in the Lord. Then verse 3 begins to change person. And now he says, surely he shall deliver you. So this, these are promises to us about the Lord. He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence, from the pandemic, from the plague. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. I, I'm tempted to preach all this, but I'm going to just keep reading. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Verse 5 says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. No, he didn't say there would not be terror by night. He actually affirmed there would be terror by night. But when the terror by night comes, you will not be afraid. Nor of the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Verse 7, a thousand may fall at your side. That's a, that's a rough day. And 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor any plague come near your dwelling. Verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. They care so much for you, they will watch out for you so you don't stub your toe. Verse 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample under foot. Verse 14, and I'll be taking my text from here. Because he has set his love upon me. Do you notice a change here? Now God is speaking. At the beginning, we had a statement of the covering of the Lord. Then we had a personal statement of faith. And then we have all of this that is about God's promise to us. Now God starts talking. And in verse 14, God says, Because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Verse 15, He shall call upon me and I will answer him. If the devil told you God didn't hear your prayer, look at the devil and tell him you're a liar. God said, you call, I'll answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I'll satisfy him and show him my salvation. Wow. Now, I can't preach all that. 
I do want to comment on myself that I was very disciplined in trying to not preach on all of that. Here's the one verse I want us to look at, verse 14. Because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I'll set him on high because he has known my name. Notice that the promise of the Lord is tied to us knowing, knowing his name. Now there's more to this verse than what meets the eye right at first. This knowing isn't just, oh, he knew what my name was. You ever forget somebody's name? It's a horrible thing. I do it all the time, so I'm very familiar with that. Sometimes I wonder what my name is. All right? I try to remember everybody's name. He was not saying that, oh, you just recognize my name because somebody told you this is God's name. There's much more to that. This is a knowing through relationship. This is not a head knowledge of having information. This word for known is the word yada. It means to know or to perceive, to declare, to recognize, to be acquainted with. To make known to others, to reveal or to give revelation about. It's more than just having information, it's having experience with. And he said these promises are to those who know through relationship. This is not just being casually acquainted with someone enough to know their first name. This is a life-altering relationship. This is a I, I know him. It's more than book knowledge. It's more than head knowledge. It's more than just hearing something and saying, okay, I got that. It is walking through life together. And through your senses, you experience who this person is is. See, no one, I may forget people's names, but I don't forget Jessica's name ever. I don't ever have to think, what was her name? Because I know her better than I know anybody else on the entire planet. I've known her since we were in kindergarten. In kindergarten, They came to our kindergarten play, and here we are, East Springfield Elementary School, and my mom is there, and Jessica's parents are there, and and the kindergarten play, we come out, and we're doing London Bridge is falling down, and guess who my partner was? (laughs) Jessica and I are doing London Bridge is falling down. She was my partner since kindergarten. We grew up together. I, I have loved her since I was just a young boy. I am still in love with her. I will always be in love with her. There is not a question that I know her name. But I know all of the details about her. I have become over this last, you know, since we were kids. So that's been almost 20 years ago. We were in kindergarten. <laughs> I've become an expert on Jessica because we've walked through things together, because we've experienced life together, because on the good days, we do them together, and on the hard days, we do them together. And when I don't know how I'm going to get through, she is there for me, and she lifts me up, and she helps me, and I help her, and we walk together every single step. And that's what he's talking about because we've known him. You know, when I went to to Lee, I was in college, and there was a young man 
who was a senior. He was very intellectual. And he was graduating with a degree in biblical education. He aced all of his classes. Don't those people just kind of rub you the wrong way? Like, don't even have to study. Just know all this stuff. But when I talked to him, he did not know whether or not there was a God. He believed that probably there wasn't. He'd got all the head knowledge. He'd got all of the teaching. But he dealt with it, and he dealt with God's word. He'd been taught God's word forwards and back, but he dealt with it as a historical document. It was dangerous. Because he thought, because he knew so much, that the knowing that he had was good enough. That's not the knowing that God's talking about here. This is the, I've given my life over to you. On my hardest days, you've been there and you've walked with me. This isn't some flowery spiritual language. This is rubber meets the road. I've experienced God and I've been impacted by him. You know, some people want to debate, is there a God? Is there not a God? I don't even try to get into the debate. Because I'm not God's attorney. I'm his witness. Right? You can try to debate with me all you want. You can't convince me there's not a God. You, 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 it would be like trying to convince me there's not a Dave Dixon. I said, no, there's nobody named Dave Dixon. Well, no, I know Dave Dixon. I've known Dave Dixon for years. We're friends. I, we've had countless conversations. You can't tell me there's no Dave Dixon because I know him. You can't tell me there's no God because I know him, because he's changed my life, because he's with me every day, because he speaks to me, because the reason that I can stand here and speak today is because of him. The reason that I have breath in my lungs, the reason that I'm able to speak is because of him. The reason that I'm able to stand and preach is because of him. Because many of you remember several years ago, and I couldn't even do this. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling just to breathe and on oxygen and, and in the hospital. And they said, there's no cure. You'll have this the rest of your life. But praise be to God, he came down and touched me and healed me. He did a work in my life. I know him. Now, let me say, I think it's fine to be able to deal with our struggles and our issues. But do you know how offensive it has to sound to God to have people say, He doesn't exist? You know, it's one thing for somebody to ignore you. But for somebody to just even deny that you even exist... Can you imagine that? That'd be a horrible thing, wouldn't it? If somebody said, no. It's, it's almost like what people do when they just say, you're dead to me. Right? And here's God creating and loving and offering his presence. And people want to debate, if does, if does he even exist? No, no, no. He exists. We know him. And you can know him too. This is a, a, an, an experience of knowing. And then it's a knowing through worship. Now, there is a close word in Hebrew to yada, and it's yada. It's just pronounced just slightly different, but they're, they're related to each other. And that word yada, which is similar to the word no, yada, is used 120 times in the Old Testament. Most of those times are in the book of Psalms. 
because this word is, draws a picture in Hebrew. And here's what the, the picture is. It is a picture of raised hands in worship. That my relationship with him is... See, I know him through worship. I come to this this place with him. The word means raising your hands. You know, it's interesting, if you look in the lexicon, it will say the Hebrew opposite of the word yadah is the word for wringing of the hands or to bemoan, to be worried, to be wringing your hands about something. And yesterday, as I was just reading through that, here's what I thought. I thought, you know, there's a whole lot of Christians right now spending too much time wringing their hands. Because they haven't spent enough time raising their hands. Because the more you raise your hands, the less you'll wring them. The more that you lift your hands to the Lord and knowing Him, the greater that you're going to see that He is above every trial, above every storm, above every obstacle that you're facing, above everything that the devil can throw at you. You're going to know Him in worship in such a way. And you know, I, I just feel sad. There are people who, who actually have never had that experience. The experience, you know, the other night as Steve and Shantae were leading on Friday night, I just felt like God just, just put his arms right around me. It was just like God was just holding me. They've never had the nearness to God in worship of knowing him in worship. That's where we're called to really realize who he is and to know him. Many examples in the book of Psalms. One of them is Psalm 57, 9. It says, I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. And the word there for praise is literally this word, yada. I will, I will declare you among everybody else. I'll sing to you among the nations. See, the problem is, the knowing of worship that we have has been kept inside the building. He didn't say, I will worship you with everything I have inside the four walls of the church on Sunday morning. He said, I'm going to do it out there. You are under assignment if you know him. Wherever you go, you need to be a worshiper. Say, well, people wouldn't understand at my job, Pastor. Your job is not to determine what they understand. It is you are there to praise Him and to sing to Him among them. To get out from the church house and go out among them and declare, oh, my God is so great. Oh, my Lord, is he is so good to me. You have opportunities for that every day. You walk into Walmart, and if you can find somebody running a checkout at Walmart, it's rare, but they still have every once in a while somebody. And if you actually can get in one of those lanes, spend a couple hours, you'll get face-to-face -face with somebody who check out your groceries. And if that person happens to say to you, how are you doing today? There's your opportunity. Don't spend time talking about stuff that doesn't matter. Don't talk about the weather. Don't, don't complain about how whatever it was that you couldn't find in the store. I'm so blessed. You know I'm blessed. I just try to throw hooks out all the time. Oh, I'm blessed. Waitress comes. How are y'all doing today? Oh, we are so blessed. Oh, God's good to us. And sometimes I get a little nibble. And then I try and set that hook real quick. Wherever you're at, you need to realize it's a place of worship. God's calling you to share 
with other people. We need to unashamedly share who he is. Somebody say amen. amen. We, need to, we need to not keep it to ourselves. I don't, have, I don't have a long time to talk about this. But let me just say, Yadah is the reason we're here. The reason you're saved and you haven't went to heaven yet is so that you can declare who he is to other people. That's, that is your purpose. That's it, right there. That's it. See, I'm not from here. Heaven is my home. I'm just here recruiting. Christians are too comfortable here. We need to realize, hey, this, this is all temporary. I'm on assignment down here. I'm just trying to grab everybody I can and take them with me. That's my goal. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, they brought the disciples in. They beat them. They threatened them. They said, listen, you cannot speak in his name anymore. And their response was, we cannot stop telling everyone we see about what he did and what he said because we know him. It's like it's in my DNA. I can't stop. It's just like breathing to me. I've got to talk about how I know him and who I used to be and who I am now. How he loved me when I was unlovable. How he changed my life and how he'll change your life too. We need to know him intimately in worship so we can carry him out to the world. I want us to look back at our text, Psalm 91, verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high. I will set him on high because he's known my name. There's a unique pro promise here. It is knowing that brings deliverance. It's a knowing that brings us to a point of deliverance. God promises us deliverance, which means we're going to go through hard times. It's not always going to be easy. We don't have an agreement with God that we're not going to face challenges here. But there is a knowing that comes through walking through the hard times with him. There's a knowing that can only come when you've walked through the fire. When you've been through the flames. When God's been faithful. There's a knowing that only comes when you cry out to him in the midnight hour. There's a knowing that only comes when God shows his faithfulness on your hardest day. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't have to be afraid of any evil because he's still with us. I know him. He's trustworthy. I know him. And he promises here this incredible promise. I will set him on high. Hebrew word there, sagab. It means lofty. It means safe, strong defended. Get this. It means inaccessibly high. God says, I'm going to lift you up to a place that nobody else can get to you. To set on high, to set safely, to keep from all hostility. He said, listen, if you know my name, there's a place I'm going to put you at. The enemy can't get you. He's going to try everything he can. He's going to throw everything he can at you. But there's a place in me. There's a place when you know my name that I'm going to put you that you are high above all of this other junk that is going on. You know, the devil's got a plan for your life. Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Satan, or Satan's desire to have you that he could shake you, that he could sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you. What he was saying was, Satan's got a plan, but I've got a plan too. 
and his plan's going to come to nothing. God will turn around for good. Even those things the devil brought against you, God will say, you know what? Let me reveal who I am to them in a greater way in the middle of this storm. While all this mess is going on in the world, all this junk is happening all around us, it's like God just says, you know my name. We have this intimate knowing, this intimate relationship. I'm giving you access to a higher level than everybody's at. I'm I'm giving you access to a spiritual plane that other people do not have access to. I'm giving you access to a safe place of deliverance from it. Let me ask you, child of God, why are you lowering yourself back down to the plane of the world? Why are we talking so much about the garbage going on in the world? He's saying, let me lift you up. And we're going, no, I want to fight down there. You know, this world, you know what this world is doing? Passing away. We're not from here, church. We need to make sure we've got our marching orders from the king. And we're walking in obedience to him because we only have a little time and a little opportunity. And we need to use them for Jesus Christ while we have it. During this pandemic, we've went through all these different stages and recommendations, and now you need to do this, and you need to do that, and this is going on, and that's going on, and we've tried to walk through everything that we can, and I believe in trying to keep our people as safe as we can, but hear me, it's not the CDC that is a covering around me. It's not the government that is my protection. I'm telling you today, God set his people on a high place, and he says, listen, nothing that the enemy has for you can get to you without going through me first. I've got a place when you know my name that I will exalt you to. It is inaccessible to the world. God will lift you up above all this other stuff. Lift you up above the wringing of hands of everything else. That's good. And even when we walk through times of suffering, and we have, and we will, God will still be faithful. Paul said in Philippians, he said, I want to know him. I want to know him. And then he said, I want to know him, Marty, in the power of his resurrection. Oh, I like that. I wish he would have stopped right there, but he didn't. Because I like the power of the resurrection. We can sing some good songs about that. We can shout about that. And then I believe Paul actually went to a higher level. He said, I know him in the power of his resurrection. That's when God comes and delivers and does this incredible stuff. And then he said, I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. God, I'm willing to go through it. God, if you just give me the strength and if you're with me, I'll just, I just, I'll have that knowing that you're with me. Sometimes you can't rely on what you feel because the suffering causes you to feel stuff. You cannot rely on your emotions. You cannot rely on your intellect. You have to rely on your knowing. I I know him. He's always been faithful. They sing that song and I sit there and bawl all my life. You've been faithful. All my life, you've been so good. He's faithful on our hardest day. God's working even when you don't see it because we know his name. Knowing the power of his name. 
there is more to this verse than I could preach in a month of Sundays. When you have drawn near, when you are seeking his face, then you begin to know the power of his name. Now, I know the president's name, but I don't know the president. If I called, he would not take my call. He would say, I don't know who that guy is. I know his name, but I don't know him. But the Lord of the universe... I know him, and he knows my name. And when I call, he takes the call every time. I know the power of his name. I know the power of the name of Jesus Christ. There are many in the world that speak his name in vain. They are saying his name without realizing the power that's in his name. There are some in churches this morning having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. There are some who will preach sermons about how his power doesn't display like it used to. Well, God may be used to heal back in the Bible. That's not for us today. Don't you deny the power of his name. There's power in his name. No other name sets captives free. No other name breaks yokes of bondage and addiction off of people's lives. No other name can save to the uttermost. No other name can bring healing. When the doctor says it is not possible, there's no cure, there's no answer, there's no hope. Let me tell you, I know hope. I know his name, and his name is is Jesus. He is our hope. He is our strength. He is our salvation. He is our deliverance. He is our strong tower. He's the one who lifts us up to be inaccessible to the enemy. He is all in all. His name is Jesus. Jesus said, I've given you my name that you could ask whatever you want in my name and my Father, my Father who created the universe, who stretched out the stars and measured them with the span of his hand, my Father who created it all. When you use my name. You don't believe there's, there is no power in the name of Buddha. There is no power in the name of Muhammad. There is power in one name. People say, oh, it's just a different name. They just... You know, the Muslims, they're worshiping the same God. It's a different name. No, no, no. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. At his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God's got a promise of knowing when you know his name. (sighs) Jesus, I thank you. There's still power in your name. Hallelujah. 
there's power to save the vilest sinner. Paul called himself the chief of all sinners. And then he was the chief of the apostles. From chief of sinners to chief of apostles. Not because he did anything to deserve it. Because there's power in the name. When you've been broken by things in this world and you've been shattered and you're in pieces, there's power in his name to bring healing. Mm. When you have been walked down the path of addiction so long that you think, I could never get free from this, I will never be free from this, there's power in his name. When you struggle in your mind with so much and the enemy comes to bring depression and oppression, the enemy tries to, to speak in your mind. There is power in the name of Jesus Christ. His name is above the name of COVID. His name is above the name of diabetes. His name is above the name of cancer. His name is... Hallelujah. 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 There's power in his name. There's power in his name. There's power in his name. We're going to call on his name. We're going to call on his name. I'm going to ask all over the room, would you stand? Now, first, I want to ask you, if you need to get right with God, if there's something in your life, if there's sin that needs to be repented of, you need to call on the name of Jesus. Whether you're in this room or if you're watching me right now, he's listening. He's listening. Maybe you've walked with the Lord but you know God's convicting you of something and you need to repent and you just need to get it right and draw near to him. I need Christians praying right now. Now if that's you right now without anybody looking around with heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around in the room and you say, Pastor, yeah, I want to get it right with God today. I've got something in my life and I need to get it right with God right now right now. Would you just hold your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Anyone else? Hallelujah. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. Whether you're here, whether you're watching right now, he's listening. Would you just pray with me? Lord Jesus, I come to you in repentance to turn away from sin and to draw near to you. Thank you for your touch in my life. I surrender it all. Be my Savior and be my Lord. Thank you for loving me and for saving me. In Jesus' name.